Thank you for being here this morning. Today we're talking about the holy days of, uh, of, the, of the Jews primarily and their worship. Uh, last week we talked about Yom Kippur. That was probably the most important day. And today we're going to talk about Sukkot. Uh, I don't know if you have Jewish friends. We had some friends who lived down the streets. The name were Rich and Emily Lewis, if I remember right. And they were Jewish, and they put up a sukkah every year. Have you ever seen a sukkah? No? Well, you can see some today. Every year, God commanded them to go out in their yard and build a temporary dwelling. And they will go out there once a year and have a day and a night where they spend it out in a booth that they build. And uh, we're going to see some of those today. You'll understand what it's about as we go through this. Uh, all the festivals pretty much occur for them. It, it eclipses in the fall. So October, September, October, those are the most important months for them in terms of their holiday. And uh, Sukkot immediately follows the Day of Atonement, which we talked about last week, very fast. This week, we're going to talk about Sukkot. Uh, there are a lot of Jewish terms I could take you through, but you probably don't speak to Jews very often, so we'll forego those. Sukkot follows Yom Kippur, and uh, it's called Rosh Hashanah uh, for the new year, and then immediately after that is, uh, is, the, uh, is the day of Sukkot. Three holidays for the Jews in about 21 days. One month is loaded uh, with activity for them. And Sukkot is an important one. Now, we're going to talk about what that thing is that's being held there, but they do a practice on, on this day. Uh, and next year, if you were here next year, you would have a, uh, an example of that. Jenny's ordered that for me, but it didn't get here in time. Um, <clears throat> Yom Kippur really is a day of reflection. It's a solemn day introspection, you're supposed to look into your heart and think about how you are at a point where God is going to decide if you get to go to a nice place or you get to go somewhere else. And uh, that's really what Yom Kippur is all about. Uh, but Sukkot follows five days after Yom Kippur. And really, it's a remembrance for the Jews today of their ancestors and how they wandered in the desert how they were living in temporary dwellings and they choose to follow through and do the same thing that their ancestors did. It is a wonderful day of joy for them, uh, but they do take sticks and they make a little building out in their yards. The festival has many names, and here's four of them. Well, there are four names. We'll get to all of them as we go through this. Normally, it's called a Feast of Booths, or sometimes you may hear it referred to as the Feast of Tabernacles. And in their backyards, they build things not quite as elegant, perhaps, as this, uh, for the most part, because they get their children involved. They get their children involved in going and picking up sticks and putting them together and make a place, and then in the evening they get to spend it out with their children, which I think is a pretty cool deal. Uh, it's also called the Feast of End Gathering. It was a festival in the Middle East that happened toward the end of the year, which is their harvest time, and they would go glean the fields, bring the, bring the, uh, the goods in, uh, and this feast occurred right as soon as that was finishing uh, in, in, uh, in their timeline. It's called their season of joy because it's time for them to think about the fact that a new year has started. God has removed my sins from me, and I've got another year to live for him. Uh, it was a, a time to celebrate a year of hard work and labor. And it's also called the festival. Uh, the festival that would occur would happen in Jerusalem. Farmers everywhere would flock to the city. It's possible that two very important events in Jesus' life occurred during this festival. The city was crowded with visitors from all over, and Jesus would have come to every uh, uh, important event celebrated in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus was there. And there, these, uh, uh, we, we're going to discuss those, but probably... Uh, this particular feast I know happened during the festival of the end gathering in the city of Jerusalem. Now, it was a requirement during the middle of Tishri. Uh, the people do no work, but on both the first day and the eighth day of the festival. On the first day, uh, there was an elaborate feast in the temple courtyard, and it was called the illumination. Uh, 
uh, there were huge candelabra. I mean, you cannot imagine how tall these candelabra were. They weren't made of gold, but they were made of metal. Uh, and they had tall ladders that they would lean up against them and they would pour wine, uh, pardon me, not wine, they'd pour oil in the big uh, canisters that were up there. Uh, and they used for wicks in those the old robes of the rabbis, of the people who served up there in the, t in the tabernacle. They wouldn't throw them away, but they would tear them into cloths and they would use those as wicks. Um, then they do something that they call the take and shake. That's the, that's the holiday here, and they're going to take these things that you see in front of you and shake them. And we're going to talk about that process. Uh, it was a one-step dance routine of sorts. It's called the lulav in Leviticus chapter 3, uh, 23 and 40. It's where you take four different species of plants, and you bring them together, and you hold them close to your heart, and you go through process, which I'll describe for you as we go along here. Four different kinds of plants really represented four different kinds of Jews. Uh, and we'll talk about those uh, four different kinds of Jews here. The ingredients were four plants held together by participants. The grouping covers four kinds of Jews, those with knowledge and doing these. So you can have knowledge and you can put that knowledge to work and do work. All right, That's one kind of Jew. And then there were those who had no knowledge, but they loved the deeds that they were doing, and they did the deeds. They didn't quite understand the background of it and why they were doing it, but they did deeds. Uh, then there were those who were not knowledgeable, but doing deeds, and those who were not knowledgeable who are not doing deeds. And this group implied, uh, this then would encompass all the different kinds of Jews that were, that were out there. This uh, yellow thing here is like a lemon, it's like an orange, kind of a cross between the two, and it's uh, oddly shaped like a pear, uh, but it is, it is uh, called the etrog. That's what they call it anyway, the etrog. And they bring all of these four things together, they make this thing that they hold in their hands, and then they go through a process, a dance of sorts, which we'll talk about. Now these four species represent every kind of man there is. A symbol of man. You were building a kind of doll made of tree branches and a huge, overshaped, and very bitter lemon-like fruit called the etrog. The structure was of willow, so the very tall thing there is a willow frond, a, a, a frond of a willow tree. Uh, then around that, they have also a date palm uh, branch and a myrtle bush branch. Now, we know of willow, myrtle, and palm fronds, but we just know, know a whole lot about etrogs. Have any of you ever seen an etrog? No? Okay. Neither have I. But here's what they look like. Uh, we know them as citron. You may have heard of those before, talking about citron fruit. Uh, this kind of like oranges and lemons on, on the steroids. The Bible calls them fruit of the beautiful tree. It's like a very pithy lemon, though, right? You have to tear off a lot of pith to get down to the fruit. Uh, the price of an etrog today usually runs around $3, but very special and beautiful etrogs have been sold for as much as $500 to well over $1,000. Now, there are pictures you'll see if you do this, if you go out and look for it on the Internet, of people looking at an etrog, and they've got a very tiny little microscope thing that they're looking at. They're looking at possible, every possible imperfection before they can grade these things. And some of them sell for as much as $1,000 over in the Middle East. Now, if someone gave you these four ingredients and helped you make a lulav and then told you to weigh that, well, if they didn't tell you how to do it, you'd probably do it wrong. You might even beat yourself in the head with it, which wouldn't be a good thing to do. Just in case a Jewish friend ever invites you to their feast of the end gathering, which they're likely to do sometime in your life. Well, probably not, but if they do, uh, it'll happen on some Saturday in October or maybe even late September. And it's a guide, here is a guide for how to do it because I want you to do it right, not like this poor little guy who's uh, beating himself with it. It's not the way to do it. Here a Jewish missionary in Uganda is showing some Jewish children the right way to wave the lulah. So we're going to talk about the right way to do that, uh, this ceremonial practice. The 
first thing you do is hold the e-trog in your left hand. Don't hold it in your right hand because that would be poor form. Hold it in your left hand and, and hang on to the thing. Don't drop it. Then, along with that, you take the, the, this, the things that I showed you just a second ago and you begin to wave it. Here's how to wave it. Now, this is from a very early pre-anything computer uh, program. shoulder pretty much is how it goes. So it's considered mitzvah. You know, we talked last week about mitzvah. Mitzvah simply means a good deed. It's considered a good deed uh, if you follow these directions. Hold the lulav in your right hand, the etrog in your left, and let the green stem of the palm extend to its height. And then you say these words. And I won't get this right, but I doubt any of you would be able to correct me on it, so it's okay. Baruch Ata. Adonai, Elohenu, Malik, Halom, Shahu Yanai, Vekmanu, Vehai Yanyu, Lazman, Aza. Now I put all of that in here how to say it, but I didn't really read that, so I got it all wrong. But you start and you hold this thing in your hand and you point and you're, and you're facing the east. Now, that would be the west. I'd be facing the east. Okay? And uh, when you face the east, you hold it in front of you. And the first thing you do is point it south. Well, how would I point it south from here? You go like this, right? And that's what they do, and they bring it back to their heart. Then they point it west. Well, if I'm facing this direction, west would be behind me, so they hold it over their shoulder and then bring it down. Uh, then you face north. It's the opposite of south. You got that. Uh, and then you go up, and then you go down. You can remember those dance steps, you'll be just fine uh, when they invite you to wave the lulav. In case you doubt the significance of that service, I gave a picture here of a, of a, a celebration that's happened in Jerusalem. Uh, there were something like, I don't know, quite a few hundred thousands of people who were there waving the lulav. And uh, it's very significant. And, uh, this happened in Jerusalem back in 2013, on the first day of Sukkot. The green stems you're seeing here are the palm branches in the lulavs that they're holding in front of them. I tried to center in on one of these people so you could see. He's holding it, and he's holding the etrog in one hand, and he's got his other hand up there helping him. And he's got all those palm fronds and everything sticking out there. Look at the number of people who are doing this. It's wild. In Leviticus, God gave them instructions on this day also to build a homemade structure in their yards. Make it quickly. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be beautiful. Just make a place uh, that you can go and live in, and you're supposed to live in it for seven days. So they'll put it up on Sabbath, and it's up, and then they live in it for the rest of the time, and then they take it down on the next Sabbath. Uh, it, it was to be a reminder of their impermanence during their trip from Egypt. Notice how there's uh, some kind of cane being used to make a roof of sorts here. Uh, but most of them just go get sticks and from dead trees in their yards, and they use it. So I'll have some pictures here to show you these, uh, and they're not quite so elegant as this one that you can see is going to be. Here is a typical sukkah. I mean, this is what it generally looks like. You get your kids involved in making it, so it's not going to be that great, right? Right? And uh, this one probably is elegant, considerable uh, to the way that they are normally made, again, primarily because the children are there. It wasn't meant to be a permanent structure. God put this in place for them to help them remember that you're only here temporarily. I think it would be a good idea for us to do this, to remind us that we're not here permanently. We're only here for a temporary period, a short period of time, really. Well, uh, I've got about 15 more pictures of them. How about this one? Pretty glamorous, right? At least the guy that the top photographed it is, he made it look all shiny inside there at night. I imagine it's pretty dark, though. They don't have any electricity that's run to it. And they bring a large table in there because principally the thing you do is you eat there. 
you don't so much sleep there and you don't sit there and bring your TV out and watch your favorite soap opera during the day. Uh, principally, it's for bringing people into their homes and celebrating by eating for the whole week. My kind of home. I'll tell you. Here's some more examples of sukkah from overseas. No two sukkahs are alike. Every sukkah that you see has its own individual personality. Um, and I guess it, the, the materials that you're going to get are the ones that surround the location where you are. So they're not elegant at all, necessarily. The one we went to was made from just branches of trees, dead oak trees, those kinds of trees. Uh, so it's really not meant to be elegant. It's not meant to keep you from rain if it happens. And by the way, a duck blind, guys, does not qualify as a suka. I know you might think it does. You might start calling your duck blind a suka, though. That would be okay, because it's what it is. It's a temporary dwelling. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we can see these guys. It's not too good of a duck line, I guess. This one is pretty cozy, isn't it? That's not too bad. It's, um, it's got cloth uh, material for the walls, but again, just made from whatever they could find, uh, trees uh, for, the, for the top of it. What do you do if you live in Tel Aviv? You don't have a backyard. There are many people in these cities, Jaffa, Jerusalem, they don't have a backyard. It's okay. You usually have a little area out uh, where you can go and uh, you can build your sukkah up there as well. So they're serious about this. Yes? Really, Orthodox Jews do this. Orthodox Jews do this. Yes, Orthodox Jews. No, normal Jews do it too. Yeah. Not just Orthodox, normal Jews. Rich and Emily, they weren't, they weren't Orthodox in any way. They were more like me than rest of the world is perhaps, but that, they do it too. It's a good lesson to teach your children, right? It's a whole lot of explanation for why you're Jewish and your Jewish background comes into it. You have a lot of opportunity to explain to them that Moses took them out of, of, uh, of Egypt and they were dwelling in temporary dwellings while they moved around. And this is to remind them of that. It's always in front, it should always be in front of them. Uh, pretty ingenious, though, coming out on the balcony. Here's a beautiful one. Uh, some of them you use embroidered material, and if you have very fine embroidered material, it makes it even better, perhaps. Here's a sukkah up on top of the building. I guess that's okay. I don't, well, I know it wasn't that way for the Jews when they were traveling from, from Egypt. Here's one down in Texas uh, a lady has put together with her family, Asuka. This is in Dallas. She's holding the etrog in her left hand, which is proper form, and she's holding the, the lulav in her right hand, as you see there. Now, I imagine when kids build their, kids build their suka, uh, they have such grand visions of how it's going to look. When they put it together, it never quite reaches what their imagination was, right? But still, it's a great opportunity for the kids to get out in the backyard and do something. And, by the way, they tell their children, let your non-Jewish friends come with you so you can explain to them what this is all about. So it's an opportunity for them to reach out to the community uh, in, 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 in a joyous sort of way. Here is a uh, go down to the local whatever and buy it and bring it home. And it's already got screws and bolts and everything for you to put it together. So. Uh, this probably to be frowned upon because it's, it's too, you know, it's too bought. You shouldn't buy one, but they're out there. This is an image of a prom frond vendor in Jerusalem near the holy day of Sukkot in 2014. Uh, this, though, is an ultra-Orthodox Jewish family, uh, and they certainly would be celebrating and bringing in palm fronds for everybody to use for their sukkah in the city of Jerusalem. And uh, there are some Kickstarter versions of these things. People have built a little bit of an industry about them. Uh, they uh, have a traveling sukkah, a folding go sukkah, even sukkah on a cart where they can haul it around from their location, bring it to you, and drop it in your yard. Uh, there's a sukkah 
Suka, they call them suka upcakes. Somebody made a, 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 cu a cupcake that they go around and try to sell them suka. And here is a suka dupa suka. I thought that was pretty cool. If you get invited to one, believe me, it won't look like that uh, in anybody's backyard. How about this one? This is no joke. This is a commercial, and I copied a slide from it, of a suka in a box mobile suka delivery service for the people in some one of the larger cities over there, at Tel Aviv, actually. I don't think they deliver this way in Fayetteville. At least I've never seen any sukas in a box here. How about this one? Apparently, it's the world's largest suka. It's a mobile uh, tractor trailer, and the whole thing is a suka. And it's in New York, of course. No, I'm sorry, that's in Tel Aviv. Uh, and uh, that Mack truck went around, at least on this day, and stopped at various places, and it was out running around all night long, a mobile, very portable mobile suka, and apparently the largest one in the world, because it had that designation. A rather gl uh, glamorous version of it in somebody's backyard. I think this was from Texas. You can see the fence they used. They backed up to the fence here so they didn't have to build that part of it. God wanted this to be a time of rejoicing, a time for family, a time of worship and thanksgiving. And that's really what it's all about for them. For seven days, they eat outside. And they bring friends in uh, and join with them in worship. But pr principally, it's for the eating part of it. But they also sleep out there, too. Uh, the reason for the rejoicing is significant. We've been through now a time of repentance now we're going through a time of redemption that we just finished that with the Day of Atonement. So now it's time to celebrate. And that's what it's really all about. Celebrate what the Lord has done for them. Now, the temple on this day was a significant number of offerings. In fact, there were 518 different burnt offerings prescribed for them that they did that day. Now, this temple shows an impossibly large altar, and on top of that was their altar. The temple's altar did not look like this. This was not, appro was not size uh, appropriate. Now, during the first night of the Feast of Booths in Jerusalem, a huge 70-foot fall candelabra, there were four of them, were lit. Talked about that. Each bowl in the candelabra was set at the top, and they would have been 75 feet from the ground. Now, these metal candelabra are about four times taller than your average zebra. Put four zebra on their backs, that's how tall these things would have been. As tall as the Statue of Liberty. Pardon me, about a quarter as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, it would have been at the, uh, at the head of the tallest man standing on the shoulders of ten other men to reach that, that those, those uh, what do you call them? Yeah, that, exactly. The bowls filled with oil. And once a year, these things were lit, standing above the walls of the temple even. So no matter where you were in Jerusalem, you could look up and say, oh, there's the temple over there. You'd see the lights from these candelabra that had been lit. The steps of the Nicanor leading up to the holy place from the women's court served as the setting for musicians. And the first night was a festival. Those who lived in the city and those who traveled great distances were here in Jerusalem sitting atop of the small mountain, could be seen for miles around on this evening because of those candelabra that were up there. You know a significant event in Jesus' life that happened on that night? It was during that time that Jesus proclaimed, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will never walk in darkness, but have never have the night, the light, but they will always have the light of life. Now, John 7 tells a story of Jesus was at the temple on about the time of Sukkot and this day where the lights are going to be lit. Uh, and he would have been there celebrating just like all the rest of the Jews would have been. Earlier in his history, Alexander Janaeus was a self-proclaimed king and priest. He appointed himself high priest over the Jews. He wasn't Jewish. Uh, if he was Jewish, it only barely so. Uh, he took the role of the Jews' king, and during the water-pouring ceremony, instead of pouring the water as he should have poured it, he took that pitcher, got the water full of it, and turned around, didn't pour it back in where the water was going to be poured. He poured it on the ground. 
Can you imagine how bad that made them feel? Uh, the Jews hated him for this. In fact, they had their etrogs in their hand, and guess what they did? Mm-hmm. They pelted him with them. They just, as hard as they could, threw it at him. And it, this ultimately then led to a brutal silver, uh, civil war. But during the water pouring service, musicians were playing on those steps we talked about, and they shook their palm fronds as the water flowed from the pitcher. Water represents life, and it was all very important. This was the day that Jesus was in the temple, and he said this. He watched them march around the altar. They said, Hosanna. And on the very last day of the eight-day feast, they would go out, begin to sleep in booths, last chance for them to walk, uh, celebrate. As that water was being poured, Jesus shouted, I am the true water of life. And it caused a lot of confusion. Some people said, hey, he's a prophet, listen to him. And others said, get this crazy man out of here. He's messing up our celebration. And then just a few days after this event, Jesus finds a man born blind and heals him. Jesus told the man in the crowd watching, I am the light of life, which I'd just seen the night before, and uh, I am the light of the world. And he commanded the man to go to the very pool where he'd caused a stir earlier, washed himself, and the man then was healed of his blindness. Flesh, uh, be, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt. He tabernacled with us, the source of light for all who believe. Thank you very much.